Um, it's a great pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Dave Alexander from Durham University today. He's our Steve Murray Distinguished Lecturer. He got his science career with his PhD from the University of Oscar Alcatraz Law, Hertfordshire, in 1998. He became then an itinerant astronomer, um, which stays on two continents. He wanted from Pisa in Italy over here to Penn State, where he studied and analyzed the atomic surveys. He then went back to the UK, where he was a Royal Society Fellow at the other Cambridge, not here. He then went as a Leverhulme Research Fellow to Durham, and that's where he finally stayed. He's now a professor at Durham, and he's the Deputy Director of the Center for Extragalactic Astronomy. When you look at his webpage, he focuses on alphabet soup of surveys to study EVN, the influence on environment, the outflows from supermassive black holes. I wrote down some of the surveys. I tried to write them out in sort of longhand, but the New Star Extragalactic Survey that I've been working on. He works on Goods Herschel and Candles Herschel Survey. Um, he works on all written out now, La Boca, Extended Time Deep Field sub Meter Survey, which has sub-surveys called West LESS and A LESS and D LESS. Slover <laughs> 2 Cosmology Legacy Survey, written down as SDCLS. SSA 22, you can get what that means to provide. The things that you do know, the Tom Deep Field North and Deep Field South, which have their own deviations, and then last, the extended Tom Deep Field South. And he's going to talk to us today, and this talk is going to be Active Galaxies in Cosmic X-ray Surveys, the Ecology of Distant APN. Great. Thanks. Thank you, Bill. It sounds exhausting when you read out that list, but... I need to update my web page because some of those surveys are finished now. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a huge pleasure to be here. This is the first time I've actually properly come to CFA, in fact, which I find sort of quite incredible. I came just for a, a day or so with Neil Brandt when I was at Penn State in 2002, but this is the first proper stay, and I've, I've really, really enjoyed myself and got a real feel for the place. So yeah, this talk is, is mostly based on a um, review that Neil and I wrote for, for A&A, which came out last year on cosmic X-ray surveys of distant active galaxies. And there was a number of aspects within that review, the physics and the demographics of AGNs. So the aspect I want to focus on is the ecology of distant AGNs, which is really the connection that you have between the AGN here that we know and love at the very center of galaxies and the actual host galaxy environment itself. And what we can understand between the connection between these two components. And most of it's going to be a review, but I'm also going to present some new work, particularly from uh, postdocs and students working with me, Chris Harrison, George Lansbury, James Mullaney, and Flora Stanley, amongst, amongst some others. And so to put it into sort of context, uh, the basic, what you're going to come across in, in this talk, just an overview, First, going to introduce the ecology of distant X-ray AGNs and what on earth we mean by ecology. And then we'll focus on three scientific aspects. One, which is the host galaxy properties in terms of the ecology of distant AGNs and asking the question, what host galaxy environments are conducive to AGN activity? What is required? Where do you see AGNs? Why don't you see AGNs? And then looking at star formation and asking, is there a connection between AGN activity and star formation? And then the very last one, the one which actually sort of keeps me awake at night worrying, are AGNs actually special? Are AGNs nothing more than just simply the black hole in the center of a galaxy where occasionally some gas falls onto it and it, and it creates and, it, and it's luminous? Or are AGNs actually more special than that and do they actually affect star formation? And in case you lose the will to live or whatever as we're going through the, the many slides that I've got, I'll give you just the, the basic... Uh, message here in terms of what I'm going to be saying. When it comes down to what host galaxy environments are conducive to HN activity, most at a redshift of one, most ha host galaxies appear to have the conditions right for HN activity, but fewer at redshift less than one. And so the, the probability or the potential to host an AGN becomes less and less as you get to the present day in terms of the host, what the host galaxy has. In terms of connection with star formation, there definitely is a connection between AGN activity and star formation, and it's probably actually the main driver of AGN activity. I'm sort of trying to make some arguments for that. And then this last one, which I think is a very important question, are AGN special, and do AGN affect star formation? The answer to that is maybe we have some evidence, but I don't think we yet have the clear smoking gun to say for sure. And in fact, I'll ask you what your opinion is halfway through the talk. Okay, so I hardly need to say it, given your audience, given the audience and given the expertise, 
But just to give a basic introduction, AGN and X-rays, of course, we know AGN activity is accretion of coal gas onto originally coal gas is fairly hot by the time it reaches, reaches at the inner edge of the accretion disk onto a massive black hole at the center where we can liberate a huge amount of energy for relatively modest amount of mass accretion. Okay, the efficiency can be 10% or it can be even higher than that depending on the rotation the spin off the black hole. And as we're well aware, I don't need to tell you, X-rays are a fantastic way to be able to identify these AGNs. They can penetrate through high column densities, one of the reasons why we love them. But also, there's this stark contrast between what you see from the galaxy, what you see from the AGN. So this is uh, an image of, of a nearby galaxy. You see all of the, the stars, combination of young stars and old stars in the optical band. When you look in the X-ray band in the 2 to 8 keV, all you're simply seeing is the AGN at the very center. The AGN's not so obvious here, okay? And I think the X-rays is perhaps, potentially, it's the most efficient and the most effective ways to actually identify AGNs because of this stark contrast and because it can penetrate through high column densities. And this here, this actual image here of this hand, just to illustrate the penetrating power of X-rays, this is actually my own hand here. I actually was fortunate enough to get knocked off my bike two years ago, broke some bones, and I was quite pleased because I got, actually got an X-ray of my hand so I can actually show part of my body which you can study in more detail. You can actually see the fractures and things on there. Okay, so what about cosmic X-ray surveys? And these are the major observatories that we have flying at the moment, particularly for the cosmic X-ray surveys, Chandra, as well we know, XMM, and NuSTAR. And between them, they've covered a broad range in the swathe of this is solid angle against hard band flux, 2 to 10 kV, this is all sky here, and this, you know, broad swathe of surveys from the very deepest ones, such as the Chandra deep fields, relatively, mo you know, modest area and sort of reasonable depth, such, such as the Cosmos surveys, and then the wider area surveys, such as what Steve, Steve Murray was sort of very interested in, is that the X-Booty survey, okay? And from across these broad range of surveys at different depths and different aerial coverage, we have a broad census of the X-ray emitting AGN population. And so here we have here, what we're looking at, we're looking at the X-ray luminosity in the 2 to 10 kV band against redshift, this is put together by Yoshi Ueda, for different various X-ray surveys, there's Swift Bat, relatively uh, local AGN survey, ASCA here, and then we've got XMM and Chandra filling out the higher redshift end and the more modest X-ray luminosity end. Okay, and so the, the results I'm going to be presented are going to be more on the typical AGM because that's typically what we detect in these cosmic X-ray surveys, more the typical AGMs rather than the super high luminosity AGMs such as you might find with the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, very extreme sources. And so just to kind of like guide you in terms of the luminosities that we're talking about here, is we're talking about typical luminosities from 10 to the 42 to 10 to the 44, maybe up to 10 to the 45. Okay, and so we're talking about moderate luminosity AGNs such as safe foot galaxies, high luminosity AGNs such as quasars. And although we typically are not finding, you know, large numbers of these very luminous sources because they're just so rare on the sky at the sort of very high end, is that these AGNs in this luminosity range account for more than around about 80% of the cosmic black hole growth. So what we're looking at when we're studying these surveys, particularly when you combine all of the different types of survey, the, the, the wider area with the deeper surveys, is that we're looking at the majority of the, of the black hole growth. And so when we're looking at the host galaxies and something about the ecology, we are understanding about something about the environment that is responsible for the bulk of the cosmic black hole growth. And of course, most of the X-ray AGNs are obscured. This is the result from uh, 2006 by Paolo Tozzi in the Chandra Deep Field South. It's just simply a distribution. The number of AGNs is a function of the column density. And just to guide your eye here, this is broadly where, where we talk about obscured and unobscured objects. Column density less than around about 10 to the 22, which is roughly what you have for a typical sheet of paper is around about 10 to the 22 in terms of the column density. You can hold it up to a, to a bright source and can actually see through it, okay? Column density higher than that, we call obscured. Column density lower than that, we call unobscured. And the majority of the X-ray AGNs in these cosmic X-ray surveys are in the obscured end. Now, I'm not gonna talk much about New Star because most of the talk is, is much more focused on the, on the review. And at that time, we didn't really have mature results from New Star when we were writing the review. 
But what I do want to say some things about Nustra, and one of the, the key things that Nustra is really teaching us is that the absorbing column densities, particularly for the most heavily obscured sources that we detect in the Chandra and XMM surveys, we're finding that they are quite often underestimated from the softer energies that we have with Chandra and XMM, particularly at a redshift less than one where the rest frame energies are comparatively modest. And this is showing a plot from my student George Lansbury, where this is 2 to 10 keV luminosity against column density. And these are for, for quasars, Sloan Digital Sky Survey quasars, a redshift between about 0.1 and 0.5. And this is showing the, the, the points here for these five, six objects, five objects. This is what we measure with Chandra and XMM. And the correction that you see here, this is what we then measure when we got the higher energy data of new star combining new star along with the Chandra data. And we're finding that some of these sources where the column densities, you know, are, are maybe 10 to 22, maybe 10 to 23, we're finding they're actually being underestimated and that many of them actually much higher than that. And that's, I think, one of the main contributions that New Star is going to be making over the next year or so um, with regards to what we're finding from Chandra and XMM. So why ecology? So I'll give you some background into the cosmic extra surveys. Now, why ecology and what on earth does ecology mean, you might even ask. And that was, in fact, what I actually asked when Neil Brandt said, you're going to write the ecology section. I thought I knew what ecology meant, but I wasn't, I've never heard of it in an astrophysical context before. And so I actually had to look up the definition. So the definition for ecology is the scientific study of interactions between organisms and their environment. And you can see a collection of ecologists here, some ecologists in action, studying the environment of this flower here, not being particularly scientific because they're going to completely destroy the environment that this flower is in here. One of the reasons that I really like this picture is that the person taking the photography here actually looks like Neil Brands as well, so it seems very appropriate that I should have this here. So Neil is actually in the, in the photo. So this is fine, and this is understandable when we're talking about biological systems. What do we mean by ecology of AGNs? Well, that's really kind of talking about the environment that the AGNs are found in. Okay, and so this is, this is the host galaxy environment, and what are the properties? What are the properties that we, am I going to be looking at when I'm going through talking about the ecology of AGNs? I'm going to be looking at the host galaxy mass, the host galaxy color, the morphology, and the star formation. And what we want to explore is the connection between the growth of the black hole at the very center that's causing the AGN activity and the growth of the galaxy. Okay, and that's what we mean by, by the ecology. So why is this a sensible thing to do? I mean, you go back 20 years or so, and this might seem a kind of a kind of crazy thing to do. What's the motivation behind that? But sort of very well sort of understood now that there appears to be some kind of connection between the growth of the galaxy and the growth of the black hole. It's shown from this, you know, sort of very famous plot here. But what we got, this is looking at nearby galaxies. So these are not galaxies necessarily where there's even an AGN, particularly not a luminous AGN in them. And this is plotting the, the mass of the bulge, or you can plot the velocity dispersion of the bulge, the luminosity of the bulge against the mass of the black hole. And you see this, you know, surprisingly tight and compelling relationship between these two properties, indicating that when you have a massive bulge, you're going to have a massive black hole. And so if you want to move on this axis here, if you want to increase the mass of your bulge and mass of your galaxy, you've got to be accreting gas, you would have star formation. If you want to grow on this axis here, move up this axis, then you need to have AGN activity, which is how we grow, which is how we grow the, the black holes. And so to first order, this suggests that there's some connection between the growth of the black hole and the growth of the galaxy. This is a, sense, a good sensible reason why we study the ecology of AGNs. Why it's a crazy idea is because of the huge differences in the size scale between the black hole and the galaxy. The difference in the actual physical size scale, if you're taking the Schwarzschild radius for the black hole, you're taking the bulge for the galaxy, it's about a factor of a billion, about a factor of 10 to the 9. Now, you know, there are a fair number of billionaires in, in, in the world, and what does a factor of a billion mean? It's quite difficult to get your head around it, really. is a difference between the size of a grape and the size of the Earth. And so how there can be some connection between things at such vastly different size scales seems really quite incredible. Even if you say, well, the Schwarzschild radius is not the relevant thing, the relevant thing is the radius of gravitational influence of the black hole. It's still around about a factor of a thousand difference in the actual size scale between the galaxy and the, the gravitational potential of the black hole. 
So these big differences suggest there's likely some regulation between the AGN activity and the star formation between the growth of the black hole and between the growth of the galaxy. So what can we have in terms of regulation? What kind of regulation processes could we think about? So we can think about inflow. We can have regulated gas inflow. And just, you know, the two broad kinds of inflow that we think about is one of the, the spectacular major mergers, two gas-rich galaxies coming together, talking the gas, driving it down towards the center of the galaxy, initiating star formation activity, initiating, initiating an AGN, and potentially producing an early type galaxy or whatever, okay? Major merger kind of scenario. The other way is, is, is uh, secular processes, which is what we see for a lot of certainly nearby AGNs, where you just simply have processes in the galaxy that can remove, the, um, can remove angular momentum, gravitational torque, such as bars, <coughs> such as nuclear spirals and things, which can be a mechanism to drive the gas into towards the center, where onto the black hole, where you can have the AGN activity. The other type of regulation we can think about as well in terms of sort of the inflow is actually star formation regulated growth as well. And so we know that star formation, okay, is forming stars, but the majority of the gas is actually not locked up in stars. The majority of the gas actually gets ejected. In fact, particularly in the massive stars, actually gets ejected out into the interstellar medium. And this might actually be a connection for how the gas can actually get onto the black hole and causing, causing the AGN to shine. And certainly, these are basically driven by the same cold gas supply. Although we think about around the, the black hole, we think of the gas not being particularly cold. It's maybe, you know, several million Kelvin or so. And so that was originally cold gas from, from the galaxy that's just simply been heated up through viscosity in the, in the accretion disk. Of course, we can also think about regulation in terms of outflows as well. And so rather than the regulation in terms of the galaxy being the driver and driving the gas, down onto the black hole. We can also think of the AGN as the main driver and the AGN regulating it through these, through these outflows. You know, this kind of picture that is, that's sort of very famous these days. This is a hydrodynamical simulation from Tiziana Di Matteo. It's, you know, over a decade old now. We're simply just looking at the gas here in a major merger scenario. Gas gets driven down to the center. And when we see this, that activity going on there, that's a quasar wind that's driving the gas out of the galaxy. And so you end up with a sort of relatively poor galaxy. What was originally two gas-rich systems end up being relatively poor. And just showing from another simulation here from Volker Springle, just showing the star formation rate with time. And this is, the, this is the, the situation where you don't have any of this AGN feedback. You don't have any sort of quasar driving the gas out of the galaxy. This is a scenario when you do have the AGN feedback, where you have the gas being driven out. And you see that, you know, with the AGN there, this is a, an effective way to suppress the star formation within the galaxy. And so put another way, one of the ways that I like to think about this, are AGN special? Okay, so is the AGN just simply the marker that the gas has reached the hole at the center of the galaxy? And so, you know, the Masters was on until last week. And is it just simply just at some point that the gas gets towards the black hole at the center and just by chance there's some duty cycle, just by randomly a golfer just hitting his ball across the green, that at some point it's going to go onto the black hole and you're going to see the AGN light up? Or is it, or does the AGN actually have a profound influence on the evolution and growth of the galaxy? And this is just simply showing this outflow schematic here. You've got a, gold, a cold gas reservoir, you get outflows and winds driven by the AGN and push the gas out and actually suppress the star formation. And so what I say in this talk, what I'm particularly focusing on is, is actually radio quiet AGNs. I'm not talking about the radio AGNs, okay, where we have good evidence, particularly in sort of BCG in, in, in clusters, the, the Bryce's cluster galaxies, certainly having some impact on the gas within the cluster kind of environment. What I'm talking about is much more in the radio quiet AGNs with sort of quasar driven, driven outflow. And is that, do AGNs have a significant impact on the galaxy? Or is it just simply the black hole is at the center, is letting you know like a little flag that the gas has reached the center of the galaxy? And so, in fact, this is where I want to have a little bit of audience participation within this talk here. And so I actually want to get your opinion on this. 
So do Radio Quiet AGN drive gas out of the galaxy and shut down star formation? So you have three options in terms of your answers here. You can either not agree, you can moderately agree, or you can strongly agree. So can I have a show of hands? Who thinks that, because I'm quite interested in, in sort of broad general community opinion, who thinks that AGNs do not have any impacts on their host galaxy through star formation? Okay. Okay. So we got maybe, we got a couple of percent there. Maybe we got about three, four percent. Okay. Who moderately agree with this? All right. Okay. I can't count the, the hands, <laughs> but that's, there's a, okay. There's definitely a fair bit more. Who strongly agree that this is going on? Wow, this, okay, right. So the moderately agree are the ones that have it, and the strong, there's a, there's a reasonable number of the strongly agree. So we, we asked exactly the same question. We had a, we had a meeting in Durham um, two years ago, well, a year and a half ago now, on looking at the connection between AGN activity and star formation. We actually polled all of the audience at that time. Okay, and this was, this was the results that came out, which I think is broadly reflected by what you actually said as well. There were, um, te so there were, Actually, it doesn't, which is different, in fact. 30% didn't agree at all, even given it was an AGN versus Star Formation Conference. 30% didn't agree, where we only had around about 5%, I think, from the audience. 60% moderately agree, which is broadly consistent with, with, with you guys, moderately agreed. And only 10% strongly agreed, right? So it's probably more like around about 20% on the, on, on the hands that I've got. And so certainly, either way that you look at it, I think the sort of the, the, the broad census in terms of what the majority population believe there's probably some truth to it, but they're requiring more evidence, I think is probably where we're kind of at at this point, right? Which is a good reason to motivate why we should actually do more observations and more studying of this. Great. Okay, so now going through just the actual sections and just looking at the, the host galaxy environments and the ecology. And so in this first aspect, let's look at what host galaxy environments are conducive to AGN activity. And in this, we're going to be looking at the host galaxy mass, host galaxy color, and the host galaxy morphology, and asking the question, is there anything special about the host galaxies where they, an AGN is present, okay, as compared to those where an AGN isn't present? And so although the, um, these uh, x-rays are fantastic for identifying AGNs, so not very good at characterizing the host galaxies in any kind of way, but because the majority of them are obscured, the luxury that we have is that in the optical and near-infrared band and the UV band, what we're mostly seeing is starlight rather than the emission from, rather than the, emission from the AGN. And that's nicely illustrated from this plot here. This is simply, these, these are SEDs for AGNs of different luminosities, and this is log luminosity here in the X-ray band. So the lowest luminosity going up to the highest luminosity. This is simply, this is frequency. This is wavelength here from the UV out through into the mid-infrared. All right, and then this is a type 1 quasar from Sloan, just to show you the strong emission that you're getting from the AGN, okay, from the accretion disk, from Sloan quasars. And you see for most of the AGNs, particularly down at the more modest luminosities, you're seeing this bump that's peaking in the near infrared band. What we're looking at here is we're looking at starlight rather than the emission from the AGN. Well, that's quite wonderful because what it means is that we can actually start characterizing the AGN in the optical near infrared band and say something about the host galaxy properties. Do you redshift correct the frequencies at which you're measuring those SEDs? Ab absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. That's key. You're absolutely right. It's key that you need to be looking at the right rest frame, rest frame band. You can even do this for unobscured AGNs as well. You can, you can potentially measure the unobscured AGN from the host galaxy, but more care is required, and you have to be a little bit more cautious about how confident you can be from the host galaxy masses and, and what have you. And this is, by the way, you actually see on a lot of the slides, you see that I'm indicating the key facilities in terms, of, in terms of making measurements. I just simply indicate with these icons here. So what we find is if we're looking at, at stellar mass, the mass of the, of the galaxies is a function of redshift. And so the AGN host galaxy is shown as black. And then the other, the other points are galaxies where there's no evidence for an AGN, no clear evidence for an X-ray AGN anyway. Red points are galaxies where they have red colors. Blue points are galaxies where they're defined by, by blue colors. Fairly obvious. And sort of the thing that really strikes your, you know, hits your eye when you actually look at this it's a majority of the X-ray AGNs are actually in the, in the sort of massive end, okay? They're definitely hosted in more massive galaxies in terms of the X-ray AGNs than compared to the overall galaxy population, okay? So your typical host galaxy is somewhere around about M star, 
all right, around about the division between a massive galaxy and a not so massive, massive galaxy in terms of galaxy luminosity functions, mass functions. However, and it took some time before it's actually appreciated in the community, this is, this is very much driven by a selection effect. Because we've got an X-ray survey with some limited sensitivity, and because also, when, as you go down in luminosity, it can start becoming ambiguous whether you've got an AGN or whether you've got some star formation going on. So you can't go down just deeper and deeper and deeper and always be sure that you've actually got an AGN in the X-ray band. Because of these limitations, it actually means that it's more difficult to detect an AGN in a lower mass galaxy, because if you think about it, a lower mass galaxy will have a lower mass black hole. And if it has to be luminous above 10 to the 42 in the X-ray band to be detected, that will mean that black hole needs to be accreting at a pretty high Eddington ratio. And that means you're just less likely to detect it than an AGN with a, a accreting at a low Eddington ratio, simply because you have many more low Eddington ratio systems and you have high Eddington ratio systems. And so what we understand now, and, and you can't say with like 100% confidence, but certainly what appears to be the case, is that the absence of AGNs in these lower mass systems is really much more due to a selection effect rather than it actually being due to a true physical thing. Okay? If we were able to, in the X-ray band, go even deeper and be sure that we can identify the AGNs from, from uh, star-forming emission in lower mass galaxies, you know, we expect these to be pretty much be hosting AGNs as well. They're just typically at lower luminosities. So what that really means is that you then have to be very careful. And cer certainly, you know, about 10 years ago, people were not sort of so much aware of, of this, this selection bias in terms of the masses of the galaxies for the AGNs and X-ray surveys. Now we're very aware of this. Whenever you want to look at any other host galaxy properties, you need to be cautious that you're looking at galaxies that when you're looking at the galaxies that don't host the AGNs that you take into account of, of the range of masses. And so you look at a mass match sample. You look at a sample of galaxies not hosting AGNs that have the same range in stellar masses. And so what we're looking at here is we're looking at two plots to say something about the colors of the AGNs versus the, the galaxies not hosting AGNs and to say something about their morphologies. And so in this plot here, we're looking at color magnitude diagram. So we've got magnitude here, this is absolute magnitude in these silly magnitude units. On this axis here is color, rest frame color, U minus V. And where you see the, the bright larger symbols, these are the AGNs and the blue ones are where they're residing in blue galaxies, the red in the red galaxies, and the green where they're lying in the, in the green valley between the, the blue and the red galaxies. And where you can see the smaller points, you might not be able to make them out so much. These are mass matched inactive galaxies. So red shift to zero to one, one to two, and two to three. And what we find when you mass match the inactive galaxies, so they've got the same range of masses as with, with the active galaxies, you find that they pretty much have the same range in terms of the colors for the inactive and active. There's not a great deal of difference between them. However, and one of the nice things about you know, doing a review is that you, you try to synthesize a whole range of different studies. There are actually some hints that as you, as you decrease in redshift, as you go down to redshift less than one, there are starting to become some hints that the galaxies are, that host the AGNs are starting to become bluer and they are starting to become more disk-like. And in fact, by the time you get to redshift of zero, using the Swift Bat survey, you see a distinct difference where the AGNs are definitely more likely to reside in bluer disk galaxies than non-AGNs. And this is a morphology side here. I should have said this before actually uh, pointing out some of these points here. This is a different morphologies for the AGNs. This is just shown an example at redshift of two for the AGNs. And the galaxy is not hosting an AGN, but, but matched in mass. Those found in terms of a disk morphology, a spheroid morphology, irregular and peculiar. And you see that there's really not sort of much of a difference. Okay? And it's only, you don't really see much of a difference in terms of these sort of cosmic X-ray surveys at a redshift of let greater than one. You start seeing some differences at a redshift less than one. And by the time you get to the present day, you definitely are seeing some strong differences. And so most galaxy environments at a redshift greater than one appear to be conducive to agent activity. They really have what's required. They're AGN compliant in some way. They could be driving AGN activity, but they become less so by the time we get to a redshift of zero. We'll actually explore why that is um, in, in the next section. And so what about the inflow signatures? I talked about regulation, in terms of regulation where the host galaxy is the, the, the boss and driving gas in towards the central regions. And think of the two kind of main modes, major merger driven, versus secular. And so the plot that we're looking at here is, we're looking at a plot which is, which is the fraction of AGNs 
And Galaxy is not hosting an AGM, but again, mass, um, matched in mass as a function of Redshift from a study done by David Rosario. And I've actually added on a data point, a Redshift of point 0.1. This is what I've added here from, from Cotini to go right down to the lowest Redshift we possibly can. And what we actually see is that the major merger fraction for the AGNs is roughly consistent, around about something like 15, 20% or around about that kind of fraction. It's a function of redshift. So these are relatively luminous AGNs, I should say. You actually see at the high redshift end, you actually see that it's the same major merger fraction for inactive galaxies as well, for matched in mass. But you actually start to see this deviation by the time you're getting towards the present day. All right. And a lot of this deviation really does rely on this point here, this point I added from Cotini. And so I need to put a caveat at this point. The analysis done here is not completely consistent with the analysis that's been done here. And so there is there is a definitely an opportunity to do a self-consistent analysis at a redshift of zero with the cosmic X-ray surveys. But certainly there's already sensitive evidence from David Rosario's work at redshift less than one that you're starting to get some kind of deviation. Sorry, David. Yeah. So this, this is where you see clear evidence for uh, di disturbance. Yeah, absolutely. But it's a very good point, and it's absolutely why you need to take with a pinch of salt the data points I've put down here with these ones. Because this, first of all, you know, that you can classify mergers in a different way, right? So you need to be self-consistent. The second problem, of course, you have higher signal-to-noise data here than you do here as well. And so there's these kind of issues. But, but I, I think it would be nice to actually do a consistent job right across all the redshift ranges to see. So there's certainly, there's certainly some evidence that, that the environments of ordinary galaxies are sort of kind of changing in terms of how compliant they are to agent activity and how conducive they are to agent activity as you, as you move down in redshift. Okay, just highlighting that point there where they start to deviate. <clears throat> okay, so in, in the next section, it's kind of particularly motivated by what we saw in the last section, is to now ask the question, is there a connection between agent activity and star formation? Does that actually help us understand why some galaxies are compliant to AGNs and conducive to AGNs, and some aren't. And so now if we want to measure star formation, particularly if we want to measure it in the distant universe, is the, the most effective way we can do it is by going into the far infrared band, because a lot of the star formation is dust obscured. And so that emission from the dust gets heated up, and it emits it thermally in the infrared band. It's the kind of facilities that you want to be used to be effective at studying the star formation, it would be Spitzer, Herschel, and Alma, moving from mid infrared, far infrared, out to the submillimeter. So that's great, but we also know because there's dust around AGNs, that AGNs also emit strongly in the infrared band as well. Fortunately, they appear to broadly have different kind of SEDs, so they're both in strong infrared emitters, but the AGNs are shown in this kind of plot here. This is, uh, this is a observed wavelength, a rest wavelength here for an AGN at redshift of 2.2. And plotted on it are two different templates. This is a template from an AGN. This is what we think the SED of an AGN looks like in the infrared band. This is what we what we think from star formation. The star formation peaks at longer wavelengths. It's basically cooler than the AGN, which is peaking at shorter wavelengths, more in the mid infrared wavelengths. This is typically stronger, uh, typically hotter rather. Now, ideally, you want to decompose the SED for all of your sources to identify the AGN component, subtract it from the star formation component if you want to look at the star formation. However, particularly for the majority of the sources in the X-ray surveys, pretty much taking the fire infrared wavelengths is, is pretty much fine in terms of measuring your star formation because it's comparatively rare that the AGN appears to dominate. I say this with, again, some caveats in that there is some ongoing arguments exactly what the SEDs of AGNs are, okay, and how much can actually be contributing out in the fire infrared band. But broadly, we think this is roughly the right kind of shape where they peak more in the mid-infrared and star from the galaxies peak more in the far infrared, unless the AGN is particularly luminous. So what do we find? So what we're looking at here is, this is a star formation rate, plotted as a function of redshift, and these are the AGNs are your red points, and non-AGNs, but matched in mass again, are your blue points here, okay? It's so the first thing that you note is you get this increase in star formation rate for either the AGNs or the non-AGNs, okay? And we sort of, we studied this in much more detail with Herschel. This is mostly based on Spitzer, but well, this is based on Spitzer results. Study this with Herschel as well, and we see this in Herschel, that you get this increase in star formation rate from simply galaxies as you go out in redshift, 
Okay, there appears to be some more. There's a larger amount of coal gas supply. Can be could be powering more star formation at high redshifts than what we see at lower redshifts. The second thing that you notice as well in this mass match sample is that the the AGNs and the non-AGNs appear to broadly trace exactly the same tracks. Okay, there appears to be not really a significant difference. It's interesting. There's potentially some difference as you go down to a redshift less than less than one here. This is basically the median that we're looking at here. Okay. But this was done with Spitzer. There are some uncertainties. You really want to be going out to the firing thread. This is mostly based in the mid infrared band. You want to go in the firing infrared band. So let's look at some results with Herschel. So what we're looking at here is we're looking at specific star formation rates. So this is where you look at how rapidly the black the, the galaxy is growing. Specific star formation rates are star formation rate divided by the mass of the galaxy, due to the relative growth rate. It's kind of like the Eddington ratio, but for galaxies rather than for the black holes. Specific star formation rate here, product of the function of the redshift. AGNs in different two different X-ray luminosity bins, 10 to the 42, 10 to the 43, 43 to 44. And then the gray points that you can see behind, these are simply just star-forming galaxies. Okay, You can maybe see it more clearly here. This is the average of these objects from stacking them, because in general, most of these objects are not directly detected by Herschel to get a direct measurement. And you actually see that the star formation or the specific star formation rate in the galaxies appears to be pretty consistent with what we actually see for star forming galaxies, which is what this track here is. And this is a track here. These are just two different ways of sort of measuring the average star formation rate of galaxies. And you have got what's called this kind of main sequence of star formation, this fairly tight range of distribution in specific star formation rates that we see for star forming galaxies. So the AGNs appear to basically track the star formation rates and specific star formation rates that we see for the star forming galaxy population. There's not obviously any really strong significant differences. And in fact, we were fortunate enough to get some, some alma data and we got a paper published um, uh, earlier this year using high resolution alma data. So this is um, sub arc second resolution around about 0.3 arc second resolution, looking at some redshift two AGNs and the AGNs are shown in the red and the, the blue points here. OK, and so this is plotted. This is a full width half maximum. This is the size of the ALMA emission, the size of the submillimeter emission, 870 micron emission, which is broadly rest frame far infrared at a redshift of two, compared to what we see for star forming galaxies, which is all of the black points. So this is, this is uh, infrared emission from star formation. And this is basically the size of the infrared emitting region. OK, and what we see is that the, the sizes and then here, this is the, the surface density of star formation, so the number of uh, solar masses per year per square kiloparsec. We see that they appear to be broadly consistent between the AGNs and the non-AGNs. Okay, So we don't appear to, clear to see any difference in terms of the extent and the surface density of star formation between the AGN galaxies and the non-AGN galaxies. Okay, But a caution here, we've only simply got a few AGNs that have been observed so far, and we certainly want to fill this out much, much more. So broadly, they appear to be comparable to star-forming galaxies, the AGMs. But there was a result that puzzled us really for some time, and it's, it's, I'm going to illustrate it in just these, these next two plots. So what you're seeing here is you're seeing uh, the infrared luminosity from star formation. This is done by my student, Flora Stanley. This is where we're removing the AGN components. We're actually doing SED fitting for the sources. We're removing the AGN components, so we're confident what we're looking at is the star formation from the galaxy, and this is star formation right here. This is the infrared luminosity. What is the function of the AGN luminosity in the X-ray band for different redshifts? You see this increase as you move out in redshift that we see for the overall star forming galaxy population. What you also notice is I should explain how this is calculated. These are basically, these are bins where you've got 40 AGNs in each bin, and this is showing you the mean star formation rate for those AGNs in each bin, okay? And so most of the objects are not detected by Herschel. You actually have to use either stacking analyses or you have to use survival analysis techniques to calculate the average star formation rate. And what you notice is this relationship is comparatively flat. It's remarkably flat. OK, this is star formation rate here. This is AGN luminosity here. If there was a direct correlation with the, the luminosity of the AGN and the luminosity of the star formation, you'd expect this to be a diagonal line, right? That's not what we see. We appear, there appears to be flat. OK, a piece of be counter to there being a relationship between the AGN and the star formation. But what happens if we actually average this the other way? This is some work done by Ryan Hickox a couple of years ago. And so now what we're doing is we're taking the we're taking 
galaxies in infrared bins, and we're then averaging the AGN luminosity by stacking in the X-rays to get an average AGN luminosity. So as a function of star formation rate. All right, so we've done the opposite average to what we've done here. And now, instead of there being a flat relationship, we see this remarkably tight relationship between these two properties, all right? So is it important in terms of whether you see a flat relationship or, or a, you know, a tight relationship depends on what properties you're actually, you're actually averaging. So why so different? So the reason that we think so, and you might have seen this before if Ryan Hickox um, given this kind of talk before because he was the one who came up with the idea of this fluorescent tube. What we're looking at here is that the key to understanding this is changes in the mass accretion rate onto, onto the black hole. And that's what the fluorescent tube is, is to try to illustrate the kind of the variability that you'd have in an AGN from the mass accretion event onto the black hole and think of the black around it as being the galaxy or the star formation. Or kind of illustrated in this, this plot here by James Mullaney. This is the mass accretion rate as a function of time. This is the star formation rate as a function of time. Star formation rate is comparatively constant over at least a, you know, a, a, not over giga year time scales, but over tens of millions of year time scale. While the AGN can sort of vary quite substantially. And in fact, if you take into account of this fact and you allow the AGN to vary, and if you allow the AGN to basically vary right across this range in X-ray luminosity, what you actually find is that you would see when you average the AGN luminosity as a function of the infrared luminosity, you see a tight relationship, but you actually see a flat relationship and simply because AGNs can bounce around on this axis here. Okay, so it broadly seems to work. And in fact, we can even start ruling out different, different kind of Eddington ratio distributions on the basis of, the, of this model with some, with some caveats. Okay. We think that that's what we understand from that. And so I think just to kind of like summarize this aspect is that overall it appears that, you know, the, the thing is, the key point is that it's availability of cold gas, which is the likely driver of AGN activity. So we know that cold gas is required for star formation, collapse of, of, of cold gas clouds, forming stars. And also that cold gas, you know, can get accreted onto the black hole. It's not cold by the time it reaches the inner regions of the accretion disk, but it was presumably was originally cold. And so they basically come from the same kind of gas supply. Okay. And this can obviously be much more variable than this, simply because you've got a much more kind of smaller scale process, the star formation, which is much more kind of kiloparsec scale, when this is subparsec scale, and how we can understand these two processes. Now, the reason that we start seeing a difference in the environment, you know, the host galaxy environment conducive for AGN activities moved down to lower redshift is presumably because we have this declining supply of cold gas towards lower redshift, for whatever reason that might be, because it's locked up in stars, because it's been heated up by maybe radio AGN activity or whatever. And so as you move to lower redshift, probability of hosting an AGN decreases simply because you have less cold gas supply available. And so in this very last section, we're now just going to address this final point about, you know, are AGN special? Do AGN, are AGNs anything more than just simply the black hole at the center of the galaxy, flagging up that the gas has reached the center of the galaxy? Or does the AGN activity actually affect star formation? And so going back to this hydro simulation here, where we got the gas being driven down through, in, in this case, through a major merger, it doesn't necessarily need to be a major merger, it just needs to have some mechanism to drive the gas down into the center. So can we test whether this happens? So if we want to test whether this happens, two key aspects that we want to have, because the key point in this is that you have AGN outflows, is we want to be able to identify outflowing gas, and ideally we want to be able to identify an outflowing gas over the extent of the galaxy. All right, so we can see that the AGN is having an impact not over parsec scales, but over the kiloparsec scales of the galaxy. And can we also have sensitive measurements of star formation? So rather than what I was previously showing you, which was an average measurement of star formation, can we actually start measuring individual star formation rates for these AGNs, start having distributions, and start distinguishing between AGNs where there's not much star formation and AGNs where there's a lot of star formation going on? So this is some of the latest work that, that we've been doing. So identifying the AGN outflows, how can we do this? Well, one effective way to do it is by using IFU observations. This is spatially resolved spectroscopy. And this is where you can have, effectively, you have your image of the galaxy, and behind every pixel, you've basically got a spectrum of the galaxy. This is in the optical and the near infrared band. 
What this means that you can do is you can start, you basically got a 3D cube now, and so you can start asking questions about the kinematics of the gas at every point across your galaxy. And this is shown from some work by, by Chris Harrison, a student of mine. And this is shown you here is, these are for three different galaxies. The galaxies are a redshift of two. Okay, and what we're looking at here is we're looking at the distribution of the gas. We're using O3 as a tracer of the gas here. Okay, and this is the, this is the flux, the gas. You can see how extended it is. Right, this is with five kiloparsecs, you can see here, the extended over around about 20 kiloparsecs or so. You have it seen photoionization at least from the AGN over 20 kiloparsecs or so in this system. You can see the velocity of the gas, blue shifted and red shifted from the systemic. You can also see the turbulence as well from the four with half maximum, the width of the gas as well. Okay, you can see that in the extreme cases, you can see really rough broad gas of a thousand kilometers per second or even more. And so you can spatially deconvolve these things and just to show you kind of a slice through, in fact, a slice through this galaxy here, which is actually the most boring of these three looking ones here anyway, we can actually divide the two components. So this is the velocity offset from the systemic, plotted as a function of the distance across, in fact, it's across this, this dashed line here, across the galaxy. We see two broad components, two not broad in terms of the emission line widths, but two broadly two components within the galaxy. One is this component here, which appears to be related to host galaxy processes, where you, you see a shift of around about between minus 50 and around about 100 kilometers per second from the systemic. But we see a second, much more energetic component here, not across the whole of the galaxy, but over of something like around about four to eight kiloparsecs or so, we see something with a, a much higher velocity, okay? A blue shifted velocity of more like 400 kilometers per second, all right? That's from this galaxy here. And this is where we're saying there is an outflow is present all right, has a, a high velocity compared to what you see from the host galaxy properties. We've done some work in the local universe looking at local luminous AGNs, obscure quasars, you call them. We found every single one of these with high signal to noise ratio IFU data hosted large scale energetic outflows. Okay, we put a lower limit at 70% simply because we only had a sample of 16 of these objects. And so we had, you know, comparatively small number of statistics. What about if we move to higher redshifts where the bulk of the, of the black hole growth is going on? And so we're fortunate to have uh, a 15 night VLT program using KMOS. So KMOS is a multi IFU. So instead of having just a single IFU, you've got 20 IFUs in one go, like, like a multi object spectroscopy, but now with IFUs. So you can actually target 20 objects in one go. The space density of AGNs aren't large enough that you can do that, not even in the deeper sectoral surveys. You don't have enough to fill them out. So we're always observing galaxies at the same time. But what it means is we can actually build up in a comparatively modest amount of time a large sample, IFU data for a large sample of, of objects. And so we're roughly halfway through the program. The idea is to observe 200 X-ray AGNs and redshift to 0.5 to 2.7 to say something about their gas kinematics. And this is some results from the first paper that's come out by, by Chris Harrison. Again, he's a very productive student. He's now a postdoc, actually. And just showing you three examples here. This is the, the gas kinematics from the O3 emission line. All right, so you can see clearly a broad component here. Seems some variety in what you actually see. Narrow component and a broad component that's blue shifted. All right, these, there's not much of a blue shift here. You can see there's not much of a blue shift here as well. And you can actually see some difference between the broad gas and the narrow gas in terms of the actual spatial distribution. This is an interesting plot because it shows you the cumulative fraction, so the fraction of objects that have gas kinematics above some certain amount. So this is in terms of a full width half maximum. We're not quite full width half, half maximum. It's where 80% of the velocity of the gas is actually measured. It's using a non-parametric method. So distribution of line widths. And so you can simply ask the question, well, you know, 10% of distant AGNs, what is the characteristic velocity of the gas? You just simply look at the 10% here. You see that roughly 10% of distant AGNs have a, a gas velocity of around about 1,000 kilometers per second or so. So you can start to actually characterize the overall distribution of gas outflow rates in the distant AGM population. And so some broad statements we can make is that the typical kinematics are roughly around about 600 kilometers per second. You see in a broad component, about 10% have more than 1,000 kilometers per second. All right. And we actually find compared to our low redshift sample. So this is our high redshift sample here. The low redshift sample is shown from from the black points. We actually see the distribution appears to be similar. OK, in fact, it's pretty much indistinguishable. So we're not seeing any obvious difference between the lower redshift sources and high redshift sources matched in luminosity here. And because we have the galaxies in the IFUs as well for the ones where we can't put the AGN on, we also have a control sample of galaxies where we can measure the kinematics for star forming galaxies. 
And we find that these broader components, okay, or the components with the higher velocities, we're only really seeing them in the AGNs. And so we can say that what we're actually seeing appears to be driven by the AGN rather than from star forming, star forming processes. So we definitely, definitely outflows are occurring in, in distant AGNs. Okay, that is certainly for sure. We definitely see these. They appear to be large scale. Do we see the suppressed star formation that the hydrodynamical simulations predict? So we can start exploring this using ALMA. Previously, I was talking about Herschel results where we have to rely on averages. But now with ALMA, we can actually detect individual sources, or at least in principle, because ALMA is so sensitive. So we want to identify AGNs, measure their star formation rates down to Low, most of the star formation rates down to very low values. And so we're lucky to have a couple of ALMA proposals accepted to do this. The first results published by Jim Mullaney for the first 30 objects is basically shown here. In fact, let me just show you pictorially more of, we typically see this undetected by ALMA rather than this. So most of them aren't detected by ALMA. What this plot here shows is a star formation rate, specific star formation rate as a function of redshift. So the red points, these are the star formation rates that we ultimately measure. These gray points here, this is what we measure from Herschel. And then those, those dashed lines show the improvements that we actually get from ALMA. So we get improvements of a factor of a few up to an order of magnitude in some circumstances. You go to higher redshift, ALMA is more effective than it is at lower redshifts. Okay? But mostly what you see is most of these are upper limits. So we're pushing down below what we could do with Herschel, but we're typically not detecting these things. We're just getting an upper limit. So what does that mean? So we're very much kind of in the throes of trying to understand this. We've now got more data. So that first plot was shown with 30, 30 AGNs. we now got around about 100 AGNs that we've observed at high redshift. We can start putting together distributions of star formation rates. And that's what we're seeing here. This is basically the relative offset, okay, distribution of relative offset for what we'd expect, assuming that the, gal that the AGNs are in star-forming galaxies. Okay, so this is star-forming galaxies down here. This is a distribution. This is what we call the main sequence of star-forming galaxies. And this is what we see for the AGNs. Now, it's tricky stuff because we've got a lot of upper limits, okay? So you have to use Bayesian survival analysis techniques to, be able to try to get something out. But what we are reasonably confident of is that the actual peak, and so the median of the distribution is shifted with respect to what we see for star-forming galaxies. And so there's a large fraction of, of AGNs that have lower star formation rates than what you'd expect for the overall star forming galaxy population. So the median is lower than what you see for star forming galaxies. What these points here are, these are the means that you get. And you see that you see the mean is consistent with star forming galaxies, which is consistent with what Herschel has been telling us. But the actual median, the peak in the distribution, appears to be shifted to lower star formation rates. OK, so it looks as though not all AGNs are necessarily hosted in star forming galaxies. All right. Um, perhaps we're seeing some evidence for the AGN suppressing star formation. Perhaps the reason why the star formation rates are lower in the AGNs in terms of the median than for star forming galaxies is because the AGN has suppressed the star formation through these outflows. Okay, possibly, but we don't know whether that's the case. It's very tricky business doing that. What we want to be start doing is connecting the star formation rate constraints with the outflow constraints we have from VOT KMOS that I was showing you, the IFU, to actually start directly testing this kind of idea. Whereas going to be quite complicated testing it because we've got a number of different time scales to take into account, such as how long it takes for the, for the outflow to actually start affecting the star formation, how long it takes for star formation to be shutting down, how long the accretion event can be on for. If it takes the outflow so long for, to shut down the star formation that it's longer than an episode of AGN activity, then we may not even see the signatures within the lifetime of an AGN. So even once we've got some results, we need to be quite careful in terms of taking into account at these time, different time scales to see what we can actually kind of understand. But the sort of basic empirical result at the moment is that median star formation rate appears to be lower than that for star forming galaxies. Not all AGNs are clearly reside in typical star forming galaxies. So this is a summary. So the three main questions that we are, that I asked was what host galaxy environments conducive to AGN activity? Is there a connection between AGN activity and star formation? And are AGN special? Does AGN activity affect star formation? And just to give these main, the points that I said right at the very start, certainly host galaxy environments conducive to AGN activity, most star redshifts are greater than one from what we can tell, but fewer are at redshift less than one. And so as you move down in lower redshift, it's, you don't so clearly have the right kind of environments for AGN activity at lower redshift than what you clearly do in high redshift. Is there a connection between AGN activity and star formation? Definitely, it's probably the main driver of agent activity. We can understand most of the results. 
as a connection between AGN activity and star formation. Are the AGNs special and do AGNs affect star formation? Well, maybe, as you can see from the results, certainly we appear to see these outflows. Certainly we appear to see some shift in the star formation rates. Does that mean that that's what's going on? It's not clear. We do not yet clearly see the smoking gun that indicates that's the case. And this is now just some more of the details, which I won't discuss. I'll stop here. Thanks. Thank you for a delightful talk. We can hopefully turn on some lights. I don't know. There's so many buttons here. <laughs> Hi. Yes. Questions for Dave? Well, uh, I think it's very nice work that you're doing with the BNT KMOS survey. It's very cool. I just, I just wanted to ask how are you collecting the sources of ah. the luminous X ray, GM, the luminosity? Yeah, so. We, we, we're not, yeah, we don't have the luxury to signal, we don't have the luxury just to go after narrow line or broad line. We need to take whatever we can simply because the space density is comparatively low. So we prioritize the, the, the objects which are the high luminosity end. And so we're looking at the CDFS field and we're looking at the cosmos field is, is what we're doing. So at the, the higher red shifts, the typical luminosity is several times 10 to the 43 to 10 to the 44. So they're in that safer kind of quasar luminosity regime. Yeah. We, we, we do have some low luminosity sources. In fact, I did have previously, I actually showed the distribution of luminosities. We do have some low luminosity sources, typically at the lower redshift end when we're looking at those. I guess you have then also ABC, you went to the camera in daytime. You can you, for, yeah, it's, most of it's done in the candles field. Yeah, that's right. Um, but some of them are outside the candles field because, you know, because otherwise you have a small area. So we do want to have some of the high luminosity sources as well. And so some of them are outside of the candles. Yeah, yeah but... Cool. Abs absolutely agree. Absolutely agree. Yeah, there's a lot of exciting stuff that you can do. Yeah. What are the numbers that you gave when you gave um, some statistics for the outflows? Yeah. Up to a thousand kilometers a second. Do you actually have estimates for the actual mass loss rates, the mass outflows from those? No. I mean, this is so. To, to do that, you'd need to be tracing the H alpha gas, which would give you a much better idea in terms of in terms of the mass outflow rate. And it's expensive enough already we, just tracing the O3, and we'd need to use a different grism to be doing the H alpha. So we, I mean, in some of the so, so in some of the lower redshift sources, we're actually now starting to get the H alpha as well, but we don't have don't have that for many, and we haven't done the analysis to know so what it would be. Yeah, so, so, so the outflow velocities are, most of them are measured from the O3, and that's what we're looking at here. For the lower redshift sources, we've now actually got H alpha for quite a few of the lower redshift sources as well. So you can start doing the mass outflow rates. You can also start looking at velocities in the H alpha as well. Of course, you've got the complication that some AGNs have broad lines um, that you need to consider. Um, but yeah, at the moment, we're just simply very empirical. How often do we see some kind of what appears to be an outflow of some kind of above some kind of velocity is, is the first order thing so we can do. In addition to not quite knowing the, you know, the mass flux, yeah. are they, are they, is anything resolved at all? Yeah, so this is something that David Rosario is working on at the moment. And so we don't have the results yet on that. Some of them are definitely resolved. Yeah, some of them so definitely resolved. A, a yeah. Yeah, I mean, this earlier stuff here, and, and I know that other people have, have done this. I know there's, Various Italian groups have, have been have been looking at some of some of this stuff as well. I mean, this is showing you this is not these are not in fact all of these host X ray AGNs, but they actually selected to be submillimeter bright submillimeter bright galaxies. These are all strongly star from the galaxy with AGNs, but you can see what you can potentially achieve in terms of how resolved you can be. Um, we this is this is really high signal to noise ratio data. We do have some objects in our sample which are this good, but many of them are actually a fair bit fainter in terms of signal to noise. Yeah, these are redshift two. The, the, these all host X-ray AGNs, but they're selected not to be X-ray AGN. They're selected to be some millimeter bright, so they're not the comparable. No, That's our couple by a couple of seconds. Yes, yeah, so absolutely. Yeah, and this is this is the physical scale here. Yeah, five kiloparsecs. Yeah. So people have looked, people looked at these with in, in the sub millimeter to actually get the 
velocities as well? Uh, what, using the CO and things? Yeah. I don't know of results for these particular objects in the CO. No. Yeah, you could, you could, yeah, uh, yes, I mean, yeah, I agree, it's, when you typically see these broad components that might indicate an outflow, there's, the signal to noise is very low for these things, so they're quite broad, but you need really high quality data to do it, and so Markarian 231 is like the, the best case we have so far, and that's in the local universe, it's very nice, very clear, it would be quite challenging for these objects to be able to do that, but. In differences in between what what and what are you talking about? Say field AGN yeah. and cluster AGN, which probably ah. is in cluster, but it's the number of closest So you are talking about like a different environment, like a galaxy yeah. cluster kind of environment. Um, yeah, I, I do, well, okay, so we definitely see that environment plays a role. Yeah, larger scale environment plays a role. So at the higher redshift end, we've been doing some kind of complementary work to this, looking in proto clusters where you seem to see an over density of, of systems. Okay, and what we, we definitely appear to see an increase in the fraction of galaxies that host agent activity above some certain luminosity in a proto cluster as compared to the field, for sure. We did a recent experiment again with ALMA, which the results came out a couple of months ago. The star formation rates appear to be roughly consistent with what you see in the field for these AGNs, unless until you go into the center of the proto cluster, and then you seem to see an enhancement. So large scale environment definitely appears to have an effect. And if you look at regular gal virilized galaxy clusters, as you go down into lower redshift, you definitely see a difference. And now, instead of you seeing some enhancement in terms of the fractionose AGNs, you actually see the opposite. Yeah. And there's, you know, good reason for that, of course, is because most of the gas is hot rather than it being cold. So it can't be easily accreted. And, you know, that's part of, you know, what one of the, the, the results I said is that it, presumably it's this availability of the cold gas supply, which is a conducive thing. And if you're in a hot environment like a galaxy cluster, you just can't host so much AGN activity. Yeah. Do we have an idea for what's a typical what's, what's a typical evolutionary track of an AGN outburst? For example, if you see an low luminosity AGN, is it more likely to be on the like recessing part of a light curve or I do not have a clue. This is so far out of <laughs> my realm of expertise. Because, because if but you, it's if you if you if you tie it to your fluorescence, you know, light bulb model, yeah. then um, some of the indication indicators you contrast the AGS problems to, they have much longer time scales, right? Star formation rate, you know, the outflow. So let's say if you see an, 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 an AGN now and you see an outflow, does it mean it, it was launched by the same AGN yeah. you know, 10 the same ago event. When, when it was in the radio mode? It's, it's, it, I, it's a great point. So. Um, the kind of time scales that we're probably, that we haven't defined what the time scales really kind of are, but the, the, this sort of variability is really more than what we would typically see from, you know, the factor of few that you see just simply that you can see on, on short time scales. This is more like over like 10,000, 100 year kind of time scales of what the mass accretion rate will kind of be. So obviously it's difficult measuring, well, we can't measure them in a direct way because the time scales are just simply too long. You can use some indirect evidence, and Kevin Shawinsky wrote, wrote a paper that, that argued that you know, some objects you see, you, you, you know, a typical AGN is you see the, the, the bright AGN at the center and you see the, as you say, like the, you see the photoionization, you definitely see the narrow line region, right? Some fraction of these AGNs, you don't see the bright source, but you still see this narrow um, region. And so he did some kind of constraints on the basis of that, what fraction, where you see just simply the photoionized gas, but you don't clearly see the AGN on, he placed some constraints on what, you know, kind of duty cycle you might have for, from these events. Um, I mean, another idea was Andy Fabian suggested, well, I gave this talk about a year and a half ago in Cambridge, and Andy Fabian suggested looking at X-ray binaries and just try, trying to scale that up in terms of variability as well, which is maybe a good way to go. I mean, obviously, the, the gas reservoir is very different in an AGN as it is from an X-ray binary. Right. So here? Yeah. yeah. Especially as you're going to high redshift. There's a couple there that are yeah. high. And I was wondering, are they mergers? Do you know anything about the ecology? 
Ah, uh, that okay. That that's interesting. No, ha haven't looked at the the morphologies, and so that they may be special in that kind of respect. Yeah, I mean, th these ones were typically ones that were well, they're already detected by Herschel, and so we didn't observe them with Alma because there was no point. It's to yeah, you could do. You may you may well be right, and you, you might find them more likely to be emergers because these these are definitely star forming systems, right? Absolutely. Yeah. 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 I think they've all gone. <laughs> well, if not, let's thank Dave one more time. Thanks. Thank you very much. Okay, you're welcome. Good. Computer work? Yeah. <laughs> if... oh, hello, everybody. Dave is going to be here. You're going to be here all day tomorrow? Yeah. All day